Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. My name is Cyrus Fernando and I'm on the Q&A show every Monday evening at 10 o'clock UK time here to take your questions. This program is live and interactive and every week we have a very special guest to answer your questions. So if you've got any questions about the Bible, any scripture interpretations, please do get involved and write to us. Email live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are on the screen and they'll be on the program throughout the show. And joining us tonight is Dr. Dr. Grady McMurtry. Dr. Grady there. Oh, I am, sir. A pleasure to see you. And let's not forget the science to go along with the uh, the Bible, too. <laughs> Amen to that, Dr. Grady. Well said, sir. I was just testing you, sir. Well done. Well, we've... Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> how, how has your week been? How has your week been? You're, you can see you're at home now in Florida. How is it all going? Oh, I've just been two weeks out on the road going to Mississippi and Alabama to speak at churches there, but quite well. Yeah. Thank you for asking and looking forward to a busy spring. What sort of, uh, what sort of talks are you giving to these churches, Grady? Well, of course, we touch on many, many subjects. Uh, we have roughly 50 different subjects on our website that we can uh, do, most of them uh, appropriate for churches, but uh, a few that are really just for the classroom. However, uh, we talk about age of the earth. We talk about how geological features change quickly. We, we talk about uh, things, how there's no truth nor proof for human evolution from primates, that God created primates as primates and people as people. The fact that we have a similar structure means absolutely nothing in terms of one coming from the other. And we talk about things like natural selection, survival of the fittest, showing proof for creation and refuting evolution. Excellent. Well, fantastic. So we are live, we're interactive, and Dr. Grady is here to answer all your questions. So if you've got any questions for Dr. Grady tonight, talking about the Bible, the scriptures, interpretation, or science, then you can email us live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are there on screen as well. Now, Dr. Grady, there was an interesting article that I saw in Christian Today, and it's an interesting one. I'd love to get your insight and your thoughts into this, and here it is right now. It says, warning of new Christian exodus from Iraq. It says Christians are leaving Iraq in their droves because they cannot see any future in the country after years of political instability and persecution. On the website of the Children Church in Iraq, that a fresh exodus of Christians from the country is being driven by a state of instability and lack of equity. And it says the patriarch of Iraq's largest denomination said Christian minority has been suffering painfully from kidnappings and killings from ransom since 2003. Christians were also targeted in horrific attacks and displaced from their homes in Mosul and Nineveh. Uh, plain by Islamic State. But even though Iraq formally declared ISIS defeated in 2017, the Cardinal said that forced conversions by ISIS are still happening as this is Islamization of minors. The Cardinal also reported attacks on, on Christian jobs and the seizure of properties. There were an estimated, listen to this, 800,000 Christians in Iraq before 2003, but today that figure is believed to stand at around 153,000. It's an interesting story, Grady, but it's also interesting when you talk about the persecutions worldwide. We're talking about Iraq, but we also hear about persecution of Christians in China, India, Nigeria. Give us an insight into what people sometimes have to go through just to stand up for their faith. Well, of course, I'm deeply grieved by the situation and because I've done mission work over that area. I would also point out things like Armenia, Canada, Brazil, and the United States. Uh, we haven't started immigrating yet, but there's a question about that. What we see is that Christians, of course, suffer from our own religion in the sense that we are tolerant people, that while we would want people to go to heaven and become Christians, um, the fact of the matter is we don't force them. But there are religions, such as in the Middle East and other areas of the world, that are very militant about faith and try to force people into a belief, which, of course, is impossible in an inward sense. But unfortunately, there are people who are weak and will capitulate. There are those that stand high for their faith and die. And there are those that gather what they can and leave and vote with their feet. 
Uh, but what we're seeing is the Christian church around the world on all continents is under persecution in one way or another. Now, often it is physically persecuting, but but it is also uh, mental, spiritual, theological. And it is a situation in which we as Christians should be standing up for our faith, not being militant in the same way, but nonetheless standing up for our faith and helping our faithful friends around the world. So what needs to change? How can things become different, for example? What, how can we give more freedom for Christians to really stand up for their beliefs, especially in, in countries around the world? Well, first of all, I would point out that even Americans who are Christians have died attempting to help those in the Middle East or in Africa um, around the world to release them, give them freedom. Unfortunately, of course, when it comes to the numbers, when you are uh, deeply in the minority, uh, that is hard to achieve. The single biggest thing we need, and I speak as a missionary myself, is to evangelize in those areas and convert them to Christianity that they would stop persecuting the church. Uh, they need to get out of their false religions and become Christians. I mean, that's the ultimate first and foremost thing. The other is that if we cannot do that, we need to help the Christians get out so that they can live decent lives and that we can raise the monies and raise the people up that can then go back in those areas and evangelize. Is it also a job maybe for the United Nations, maybe for NATO, some of the other countries and the leaders, the world leaders? Is there anything more they can be doing from a government perspective? Well, I would point out that the last people you would want to try to get to help Christians is the UN. <laughs> Why is that? Tell, tell our viewers. Well, first of all, because the UN is highly anti-Christian. Uh, now, of course, there are different uh, religions that are represented within the UN as countries. But, uh, of course, one of the organizations sponsored by the UN was involved with the invasion of Israel back in October. Mm. And that's been proven. Um, there's a UNESCO, which is a part of the UN, was the first director was um, named Huxley, Julian Huxley. You might remember that name. And he said in his founding speech for UNESCO, which is supposed to help uh, women and children around the world, that the foundation of UNESCO's efforts would be evolutionary. Mm -hmm. You know, it's totally anti-Christian. And so uh, you have to go back to the roots of that. And then, of course, there are nations that have capitulated to other religions besides Christianity in, in the European organizations, including NATO. You have members of NATO now that are fundamentally anti-Christian. So these are not areas that you can expect to get help. Wow. Okay, interesting, Grady. I've got emails already coming in. Uh, let's go into our first one here. This one is from Chris. Thank you, Chris, for writing. Good evening, Pastor Sy and, Pastor, um, and uh, great Dr. Grady. Uh, in answering to a question from previous weeks on the confession to a priest that he came up to an answer on my second question, I explained it would be dangerous to trust people in a conf with a confession to a friend. Question. As it is unwise to tell a priest anything that one should not, nor or nor to anyone of a sin, though if one must confess a sin to a trusted friend, not to explain the description of the sin as godly or God already knows. In James 5.16, in King James Version, it states, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual prayer of a, prayer of a righteous man availeth much just shows since then, since then someone has altered the word fault to suit their denominational doctrine to have the power over people. It's an interesting one. Do you have any thoughts on that one, Dr. Grady? Well, first of all, we could say that faults are sins. After all, if, if we are not abiding exactly by God's word, then, then that's a sin. And because we do have faults, every one of us does, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I think this may be involved with what we were talking about the last time, 
And you don't have to be explicit, but the reason that you share faults one with another is that other people can pray for you. You need prayer warriors. Others can help strengthen you. Others may say, I've had the same problem. This is what I did. I have the same problem in the past, but through the power of the Holy Spirit in asking the Holy Spirit to come into my life has helped me to alleviate whatever that fault might be. Now, you don't have to get you know, grim and, and gross. But the fact of the matter is that confessing our sins one to another is a biblical position, our faults, if you wish to use that to translation. Uh, but we do that in order to get help, either from the Holy Spirit or from those around us, and hopefully from both. Very good. Thank you so much. Well, we earlier asked for scientific questions, Grady. We've got one, and I really encourage our viewers to send in some more because Dr. Grady, look at the smile on his face when I say scientific. Let's go to a full screen of Dr. Grady. Where are you, Grady? There, there he is. Look at the smile on him. Would you like some more scientific questions tonight, Dr. Grady? Sure, there but I'll go. take both. <laughs> I take everything except... Except end time questions. Well, it's That's funny you reasons. say that. It's funny you say that. I'll come to that very <laughs> shortly because I've got one specially for you. All right. This one's from Les. <laughs> and he's saying, Grady, uh, can the light of stars billions of light years away from the Earth have reached us if the Earth is only thousands of years old? Interesting question. But the answer is yes. Um, after all, the Earth and the universe are only 6,000 years old. That does not mean that objects are not millions, billions of light years away from us because, because um, that's as we are measuring it today and assuming that the speed of light is a constant as measured on Earth today. But the truth of the matter is we've never measured it anyplace else. It's impossible to measure the speed of light outside of our solar system. We've never been outside of our solar system. The fact of the matter is that even Einstein said that you can only measure the speed of light in one direction, which means that we may be seeing things now that at the same instant the light is leaving the object, but it's bouncing back at 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, so that there are many ways. And uh, if you'd be interested, I have an article on my website free to anybody to read showing many different ways in which we could see objects that are 500 million light years away and uh, still only be 6,000 years old. Um, again, we know that gravity affects the speed of light and in between large objects like galaxies, uh, we have gravity that we might call very, very thin. It's microgravity, but very, very thin. But of course, once you get into a galaxy, gravity gets thicker. When you get into a solar system, gravity gets thicker. And so since we know that gravity does affect the speed of light, it could be that uh, light was traveling many times faster than today in the past. We do know from actual measurements this is actual scientific data from 1676 to today that we have literally measured the speed of light slow down in only that amount of time. So in 350 years, we've actually seen measured light slowing down. And so it is not true that uh, the speed of light is a true constant. Uh, on the surface of the Earth, we may think of it as a constant in our lives, but that when we're talking about great distances, it's not. So there are many ways. And I would suggest you read that article on my website. All you have to do is go to the website, article page, type in you know, decay of light or something like that, and you'll get a lot of information. Wow, fantastic. That was, in, that was full of a lot of information, in that last part as well that you just shared with our viewers. And I just want to remind our viewers, we've got a video on demand on Revelation TV. So the Q&A show especially, I encourage you to go and watch this again because so much information, valuable information has been shared by Dr. Grady. On video on demand, you can watch this program, but you can also pause it, take your notes and continue watching. So thank you for answering that, Dr. Grady. This one is from Satinda, especially for you, Dr. Grady. He says, the subject is black holes. Listen to this one. Blessings to you both. As Dr. Grady will be able to gather from the subject title of this email, it is not about end times, so he can relax. Here we go. Thank you. The question is about black holes. What exactly are they? And what are their purpose and what happens to the matter which is swallowed up by them? And that's from Satinda. Thank you, Satinda. 
Well, first of all, it's a great question. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, remember, no one creates anything without a purpose. And therefore, if God created black holes, which he did, they must have a purpose. Now, what is their purpose? Well, a black hole appears black only because there's so much gravity from so much mass that even light cannot escape the gravitational pull. And so that appears black to us because, remember, we see light coming to us. But if gravity is so strong it can prevent the light coming to us, then we see it as a black hole. Now, what's their basic purpose? We find black holes all over the universe, as far as we know. And there are different kinds of galaxies in terms of shape. There's erratics, which have no particular center point. Um, there are others that are spiral galaxies. There's another kind, similar but different, called a barred spiral galaxy. And these galaxies spin around uh, and form the spiral that we can see. Now, there has to be, if you think about it, a spiral galaxy is like a wheel, and a wheel has an axle. And the black hole is basically the axle that allows these galaxies to spin around and not fly apart. So it's the, the mass. Now, when mass is sucked into a black hole, and I think too many people think of it as some kind of a, an animated uh, eating machine, which is not really true. Mm. Uh, some mass does certainly go in, but there's not, not sucking everything in. And so it's simply like the axle of a wheel, and these spiral, barred spiral galaxies turn around, and the, the black hole is nothing but the center of it that allows it to spin around. And we have a black hole at the center of our galaxy, which our galaxy is called the Milky Way. Um, and we have a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Nothing to be feared. It's a created object by God, and it has a purpose. Thank you very much indeed for that great. I want to cut to the control room for a second because we've got our lone ranger in tonight and that's Richard all on his own. So well done, Richard. He's controlling the show and he's also downloading the images as we're talking about. So well done, Richard. Good job, bro. OK, here we go with the next I, I, one. I agree, by the way. <laughs> He's a one-man band, Grady. He's a little octopus, so well done to that, Richard. Uh, Dave's written in to say hi to you both. As we know, several churches and preachers teach alternative theology. Uh, how would I know if I was in possession of the Bible that teaches alternative theology? What should I look for in these Bibles that I have? And he says, I have 22 Bibles and don't intend to get any more. 22 Bibles, that's a record. Well done. Well, remember, there are books that call themselves Bibles that aren't. <laughs> so Interesting. It's, it's a good question. It is. A, well, there is a satanic Bible. Wow. I mean, it, if you look it up, there there is one, right? And so there are uh, various denominations uh, that are not Christian. They're called bloodless cults. But they use, quote, Bibles, unquote. But they do things like add a book. Um, they grossly change the translation from the original to suit their own purposes. I mean, we could name several, but the point is the word Bible doesn't necessarily qualify as being Christian. Right. Uh, so which, whose Bible are we talking about? Now, in terms of those of us in the, the English-speaking world, uh, we have a luxury of Bibles. Um, when you go to other countries, such as, uh, say, to Brazil or Russia, as I used to go, um, they may only have two, three translations of any modern kind available to them. We, I don't know when the last count was, I think it's somewhere in 110,000, but we have these different translations. And some of them are not translations. Some of them are paraphrases. Some of them are not even paraphrases. And so the thing that you really need to remember is, yes, you want to find the best quality translation you can in the language that you speak, and we're talking about English. Um, secondly, how do you know? Well, first of all, it doesn't contradict itself. Um, it certainly is claimed to be a translation rather than a paraphrase or uh, a some kind of a simile, um, but it's not going to con con predict itself. It is not going to contradict that Jesus is Lord, Savior, Son of God, the only one, um, that he's the only way by which we can attain salvation, such as in John 14. Mm -hmm. uh, there are things that you want to look for that, that don't contradict each other and do not take away from the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
And there are things you look for. But we'd have to get a long program into that. As a matter of fact, you may remember, I did a half an hour program, I think maybe still available, uh, on our TV about how to buy a Bible. Not which one to buy, but how to buy it and what to look for and just avoid italics and other things that can be used to change the word slightly from the original. So imagine someone is watching us today and they're, they maybe turned into onto Christian TV recently or for the first time and they're thinking, I haven't got a Bible, I want to go and get myself my first Bible. What can, what can we recommend for them? Well, again, there are several good translations, and they are translations from the original languages. Um, some are kind of getting archaic, such as the original King James Version, though we certainly revere it. Uh, the New King James is helpful. Uh, the New American Standard is the one that I know Howard Condor and I both use uh, as our main Bible, but I am quite willing to use other Bibles. I think it was interesting when he said he has 22 Bibles and doesn't plan on buying any more. Well, in my phone, I have closer to 40. Okay. Okay. Wow. Well, maybe, um, maybe Dave, you need to write in and say, do you have some more on your phone? Maybe you've got more than 40 than Grady on your phone, Dave. Come on, let's hear it. It's like a little competition, competition. Grady. Competition is good for the soul. <laughs> competition's healthy, amen. And then he could say he's got some on his tablet and a computer and everything else. So, Dave, if you've got more, we'll challenge you. Let's let's hear you. All right, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Alwyn has written in to say, can you please explain how God can listen to people in prayer at the same time when there must be millions of people who are praying at the same time at the same moment? Thank you and God bless Alwyn in South Wales. I think that's a great question. Well done, Alwyn. But, but, but while I think it's a good question, I, I think the question is too small. Uh, there are roughly 8 billion people alive on earth today, and Correct. God hears every single one of them. It's not a matter of millions, it's billions. Correct. And the fact of the matter is that is because uh, you, you are thinking in terms of a small God. Uh, you need to get a bigger idea, God. And, and I'll illustrate that by saying this. No one can create anything greater than themselves. So if I could create a, a robot, let's say, that knew everything I knew, could do everything I can do, it would not be greater. At best, it would be equal, but not greater. I cannot teach what I don't know. Now, God created the entire universe, over 100 billion galaxies, uh, so many trillions of stars, we don't even know how many there are. And he says that his thoughts are higher than ours as the stars above the sands of the sea and so on. Um, so you got to think about a bigger God, because how big is God? Well, if he made the universe, then he must be bigger. And that means he's sovereign. That means he's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnijudicious. And he can hear the prayers of every single human being. And he knows our thoughts, which is a scary thing to me, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> that he knows the thoughts of every human being. And so if you think they're only in a couple of million, you, your gun's too small. You've got to think bigger. Fantastic. Uh, John is written in. John in Belfast, say, good evening, gentlemen. Um, I hope you're both keeping well. If you don't mind, I have two questions to ask. First, when Jesus turned the water into wine, would this have been exactly the same wine as sold in the off-license of today? It's an interesting question. What sort of wine was it? Well, first of all, the Bible is specific. It says the wine steward who was there said, you have saved the best for last. Now, this was a man who was a, a master of wines at that time. Now, of course, today we have, I don't know how many times more different kinds, but, but he knew his stuff, and he knew the rot gut from the good stuff, if I may say. And the idea at the wedding was you would buy the good stuff to get people to say, well, this guy's put on the, the dog here, and once they get inebriated, he'd serve the, the cheap stuff. And the, the wine steward says, now, wait a minute. You've done exactly the opposite. You know, you've saved the best wine for last, not first. But think about his assumptions. This is a man who knows his trade, but he's assuming that what he is tasting uh, started as a seed in the ground, grew out in a, in a field, um, was at least eight, ten years old or more, the plant, before it would produce grapes that you could use for making wine, um, that these had been collected, crushed, had been uh, through the process of purification from wineskin to wineskin. 
So he was assuming that all those things had happened because he tasted the result of that kind of process, where in fact we know it was instantaneous transformation, a miracle that Jesus performed. Um, and, and so to the wine steward, it was real wine, and he assumed that all those things had happened because he knew what it took to get it. Wow. The second question here in Johnny Bolfar said, is it true that Jesus' time, the main reason they consumed wine was because the water was contaminated? There is a lot to be said for that because um, what many people don't know is they also had different uh, levels of alcoholic content. They had a, a very light alcohol that could even be given to babies which would be a purification thing of, of bacteria, having a little alcohol in which you were drinking. Because in those days, goodness only knows what you were getting. I don't know about you, but you've been to Israel. Is, it, uh, is that correct? Have I been to uh, Israel? I haven't been to Israel yeah. personally. No, not yet. Oh, okay. Not yet. Well, I, uh, I have a great little thing in one of my teachings and so forth is, would you want to drink the water out of the Jordan? Mm -hmm. Now, there are people who want to be baptized in it, and when we baptize people up near the Sea of Galilee, yeah. the water is not clean, but it's fair enough you can see th through it for a while. You get down to, to Jericho, and it's just muddy, <laughs> pure and simple muddy, and uh, you wouldn't want to drink it. That's all I can tell you there. <laughs> and, of course, it has all sorts of things in it, too. Um in this case, we have modern farm chemicals in it because it's water that's been used for irrigation of crops on both sides of the river. But the fact of the matter is, there was, of course, a, a, a truth that drinking some alcohol, and Paul also says it has a medicinal value for some, when he's talking to Timothy about taking a little wine for your stomach, meaning in a medicinal way. But the Bible is also very specific, and I want to make sure everybody hears this, not to do it in excess. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. period. And so there was a medicinal value to it. There was a, a purification bacteria kind of thing in the water because I, the Lord only knows what was there. Um, but it was never to be done to excess. And the wine had a symbolic nature of the Holy Spirit as well. Very good indeed. Thank you, Grady. Peter's written in, say, uh, Dear Cyrus, great to see you both with Dr. Grady once again. My question relates to ambiguity in the scripture relating to the nature of the awful place called hell. Why does the Bible refer to hell as a lake of fire and on one hand and a place of outer darkness on the other? After all, fire gives light. Why does it say in hell their worm does not die when hell is also described as a second death? Regards from Peter. Okay, there's a lot in that. The second death refers to the fact that you've died physically and spiritually. So there's the two deaths. Uh, the Bible is very specific about that. Everyone is born once physically, but if you die without salvation, you experience spiritual death. If you die with salvation, you go to heaven. Secondly, um, you're a little confused about what we'll generally call hell, but let me say the underworld in a little greater context. The underworld is made out of different locations, different compartments, different departments. And so the lake of fire is one place, but it's not the same place as Gehenna hell, which is where the unsaved go. It's not the same as the pit or abyss. Both words are used for the same thing. Uh, and so there's different departments, compartments of the underworld. And so there's a place called Tartarus. That's a special place for the especially bad angels. And so while they're all part of the underworld, they are not all Gehenna, which is the, the typical hell. Okay, so I think you need to understand that those words are not interchangeable for the different departments, but they are all part of one unity, and we call generally hell. Hmm. Uh, this next one here is from Les to ask about time scale. Hello, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. How does a geological time scale fit with the view of a young Earth? 
Well, the geological time scale, the geological time column, it, both the words are used for the same thing. It's the idea that evolution is shown in textbooks of the different layers in the ground, different ages, uh, illustrations of different animals that uh, are associated with these supposed different ages. And this is actually the, <laughs> we we're talking about Bibles, the geological time scale or time column is the Bible of the evolutionists. And they try to convince people that these different layers were uh, different periods of time in the past and these animals evolved over millions and billions of years. The fact of the matter is that the geologic column is much better understood as the result of one year-long worldwide flood. And when you start looking at it that way, you'll realize that the, co the column, as it's called, first of all, doesn't exist in any one place in the world. We have the layers... We have fossils. Um, however, uh, when we take a look at the column as in, illustrated in the textbook, uh, for the most part, it doesn't exist. There are 25 locations on the surface of the Earth where you can find some of the layers in the order shown in the textbook. But there's one place on Earth that all exists in one place. And so actually, it proves that evolution is false, that creation is true, that the layers and fossils are the result of one year-long flood. We call it Noah's Flood. Leslie from North Wales has written in, say, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Please, could you explain why Easter and Good Friday don't have specific dates and change each year as we have the 25th of December for Christmas each year? Thank you, Leslie in North Wales. Interesting. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but you have to understand, in the Old Testament and in parts of the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, uh, we're talking about the Jewish calendar. So you have to understand, what is being written, is this the Jewish calendar or is this the Gregorian calendar that we use today? That's a very important thing. And because the, the Jewish calendar, the year is 360 days. God started with 12 months, 30 days each, 360 days. That's why we have 360 degrees in a circle. But at the time of the flood, the rotation rate of the earth changed slightly. It actually sped up a little. That's why we have 365 and a quarter today. And because of that... Then the Jews, understanding that, and particularly being in agriculture, the, the planting moons and the harvest moons and so forth, they're very important to agriculture. But once the calendar got out of whack at the time of the, of the flood, what happened? Well, the Jews insert a 13th month of 30 days every so often, so many years, and that brings the calendar back into alignment. But think about it. Passover and Easter, uh, if I may use my hands here, um, go this way on the calendar. That is to say, they go back and forth a couple of weeks every year, but they can be on the same day some years. It's because of that extra 13th month. So on the Jewish calendar, you have 360, but occasionally 390 back to 360. And therefore, Passover and good, as you call it, Good Friday, um, I, I say Resurrection Day, um, occur on different dates of the calendar. The 25th was simply chosen uh, by the uh, process of being the winter solstice um, and the Feast of Saturnalia, um, used by the early church fathers to try to bring pagans into the church. Now, that's a totally different issue. But the dates are the important thing, not the days of the week. So it doesn't matter what you call the day of the week. It's the date. So, for instance, Jesus came in to Jerusalem on the 10th day of Nisan. He was sacrificed as the lamb on the 14th day of Nisan. Uh, he rose from the dead on the 17th day of Nisan. Now, the year he came in, died, and was resurrected was a year as God the Father arranged it that the 10th and 17th were both Sundays. But that doesn't happen every year. The, the 10th and the 17th day of Nisan could be a Thursday, could be a Monday. It was the date on the calendar, not the day we call it, that was important. Now, Grady, there was uh, some news, some quite interesting news um, 
that was from our Christian perspective, I think it's interesting to get your thoughts on this, just before we started this programme this evening. And it talks about the France becomes the only country to explicitly guarantee abortion as a constitutional right. Let me just read you this, Grady, if I can. It says, French lawmakers on Monday evening overwhelmingly approved a bill to enshrine abortion rights in France's constitution, making it the only country to explicitly guarantee a woman's right to voluntarily terminate a pregnancy. The historic move was proposed by President Emmanuel Macron as a way to prevent the kind of rollback of abortion rights seen in the United States in recent years. And the vote during the special joint session of Parliament drew a long-standing ovation among the lawmakers. Now, the measure was approved in a 780 to 72 vote by the Palace of Versailles. Abortion enjoys wide support in France across most of the political spectrum, which has been legal since 1975. This information just came just before we started tonight's programme, Dr Grady. I'd love yeah. to get your insight and your thoughts on this, please. Well, and I would point out Canada with with assisted death uh, as part of their, their governmental rights and so forth. First of all, I will have to say this. I don't mean to offend our French brothers and sisters. There are certainly devout Christians in France, correct? Correct. But, but, isn't it absolutely pathetic that the governments of France has done this? And why? Well, we need to take a look at the history. The French as a nation, not individuals, became atheists in the 1700s. This is why there was the French Revolution at the end of the 1700s. Um, this is why they killed their king and queen, uh, because they had become atheists. And this is due to six French philosophers of the 1700s, starting with men like Montesquieu and ending uh, with Buffon. But... Uh, this is what happens when you say there is no God. Uh, and when you say there is no God, then we simply are thinking animals. When you're nothing but thinking animals, then you treat each other as thinking animals. And you then throw away your children. Wow. You literally throw them away. Uh, but France became very, very evolutionist in their thinking. After all, remember that Napoleon crowned himself he didn't. He wasn't crowned by the church, which was supposed to crown him as God-given authority and lawgiver on earth. Law, uh, meaning in the sense of justice, legal justice. But Napoleon had said, "Well, there is no God," and he crowned himself. Now, something quite similar has happened in other Christian countries around the world, including, as I mentioned, even here we're seeing it. Uh, but in Canada. Uh, you can now make a phone call. Somebody will come to your house and help you commit suicide. My goodness. And that's a legal right in Canada now under Trudeau. Uh, but isn't it pathetic that what was once considered Christian Europe, the, the bastion of the world, that every country basically in Europe, uh, regardless whether they were Protestant or Catholic, uh, were in fact Christian, and in the 1500s uh, prevented... Uh, a, a invasion by another religion from all three sides. Um, and today, they aren't standing up for Christianity at all. Well, a viewer could Norm has written in as well in relation to this, Dr. Grady, and talks about blasphemy. On Answers Today, we were told about a governor in California um, <laughs> who said that we Christians <laughs> had it wrong about abortion. We had a huge billboard which said that Jesus approved abortion. Have you heard about this? We're talking about Governor Gavin Newsom, uh, who is approaching the end of his second term as governor, wants to be president of the United States under the banner of the Democratic Party. And uh, he is an extraordinarily liberal, liberal um, believes that the entire state of California is a sanctuary state for illegal aliens, uh, that all illegal aliens should be given equal rights, including the ability to vote as citizens, even though they're not. Um, there are other states that are quite similar, such as New York, uh, Illinois. But this is simply because he has absolutely no moral compass whatsoever. 
This next one here is asking, is the most scientific community opposed to creationism? If so, why? Okay, remember that truth is not determined by voting. So today, the majority of, quote, scientists and science teachers, unquote, might accept evolution. That doesn't make them right. It, it makes them wrong, but it, it, you know, it doesn't make them right. And each person does have a, an opinion and a right to believe what they choose as far as we're concerned. However, we have massive proof that creation is true even without the Bible. But true science supports exactly what the Bible says. Therefore, I do both. That's what I am. I'm a biblical scientific creationist. I teach on the truth of creation in the Bible theologically, philosophically, as well as scientifically, and they match together perfectly. But, again, simply because that majority view is evolution will change. Science as a community, the scientific acceptance of things changes over time. Uh, I'm not talking about evolution of creatures. I'm talking about evolution of thought. There was a time when you could have had a consensus from quote-unquote scientists that uh, rats spontaneously generated out of a pile of rotting rags. But that was proven to be scientifically wrong back in 1668. Um, there was a time when, unfortunately, uh, doctors and scientists knew nothing about uh, antiseptics and bacteria and so on. And it is now estimated that in the American Civil War, uh, we lost more injured people by contamination of people trying to care for them than we lost from those that didn't get cared for. And the reason was they were using a bucket of water and rags and they were washing the, the wounds of, of those that were injured uh, and moving right on to the next person, the next person, next person. And what they were doing is spreading disease. And that those that were not properly cared for tended to actually outlive the number that were cared for. <laughs> and so science is an ever-changing thing. You know, I mean, there was a time when people used to at least jokingly say that the moon was made out of, you know, blue cheese. Uh, but we've learned over time, and we science is supposed to be self-correcting. The problem is that why has evolution become so popular? Because it is the scientific basis for people to say there is no God, and if there is no God, I can do what I want. And so people want to believe in evolution because they want to sin, which lines right up with the Bible. This next one here is from Jim in Liverpool. He says, uh, good evening and afternoon to you both. Good afternoon, as I'm currently on the same time zone as Dr. Grady. I'm an hour due east from him, staying with a friend in Kokoa Beach. Ooh, sounds very exotic. Uh, I've, I've Cocoa Beach. Cocoa <laughs> Beach. Okay, Cocoa. He says Kokoa. Okay, Cocoa Beach. Uh, I've recently read that some wood uh, has been dated using the lumin uh, luminance and... Uh, luminescence dating method. I wonder what Dr. Grady has to say about this dating method. Blessings to you both from Jim. We have a lot of material. First of all, I would suggest you go to an article we have that you can read for free on our website. We also carry books in our bookstore. Um, some would, can be downloaded electronically as well. Um, but none of these supposed dating methods work. I don't care whether it's carbon-14, the one that most people know of, whether it is rubidium strontium, uh, whether it's potassium argon, whether it's luminescence, none of them work, period. Uh, they, people who use those are simply deceiving you into believing that they work. But all of these methods start with six fatal false assumptions, and the first one should be obvious to anybody who's listening which is that we can measure all of these things very scientifically, very accurately today, luminescence or the isotopes in a rock sample. But we don't know the starting conditions. And if you don't know the starting conditions, knowing the ending conditions is meaningless. It just means we know how to measure them today, but it doesn't tell us how old anything is. And things like carbon 14 have 20 fatal false assumptions. All of them have six. And so whether they date it by this method or the other, it doesn't matter. You can't date anything using these techniques accurately. 
Joe has written in to say, hi guys, Dr. Grady, is it possible that Cain and Abel were twins? Doesn't appear to be. Uh, and there's no reason to believe they were. If you take a look at chapter 5 of Genesis, it says that Adam and Eve, though she's not specifically mentioned there, but, but that Adam had many sons and daughters. And they are named uh, specifically, which it would indicate that this is sequential, not coincidental. Uh, and so uh, I would say no. Uh, and it does say that this one was the eldest and that was the younger in various places, including even in Genesis. So uh, I would say no. Uh, Tony's written to say, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Will there be a new heaven and a new earth or renewed one as with no sea or sun present in God's kingdom, as I understand? Then the complexes of earth will be very different from what it is now. And that's from Tony. Well, the complexion of the earth will be very different. I do think that, uh, from my personal opinion, that it's a renovated, restored, imperfect earth uh, in the end time. Now, it does say in Revelation that the first earth as we know it, that is to say, as we've experienced it, is done away with, and it comes along a second. Uh, this also refutes things like the gap theory and, and day age theory. Um, but when we talk about the judgment by fire recorded in Second Peter chapter 3, it's a judgment by fire. Now, fire is used for many purposes, heat, light, power, so on. But the single greatest use that man has for fire is sterilization. And I would suggest to you that God created it perfect, that human sin caused it to be imperfect. It has become more and more imperfect over the last 6,000 years. But at a point, and I think soon, God is going to step back in he is going to sterilize the effects of human sin on the universe, and he's going to restore it back to perfection for the second and last time. I think that's more consistent with what we read than the idea that it's completely replaced by something else. It's just renovated, as you use the word, restored uh, is another word for it. Uh, this one is asking, what is the theory of punc uh, punctuated equilibrium? That's a fancy name for what used to be called the hopeful monster theory. Uh, punctuated equilibria or equilibrium came from uh, a work by Stephen Jay Gould when he was uh, having another gentleman named Niles Eldridge as his student getting his PhD work. Both were devout evolutionists. Both recognize the fact that there are no transitional forms in the fossil record. We never find a transitional form in the fossil record. We find everything whole, complete, as it was. But they believed in evolution. Now, uh, back in the 1940s, uh, Dr. Goldschmidt came up with the hopeful monster theory, and he saw the same problem. So he said what happened was a reptile laid an egg and out popped a bird. That's called the hopeful monster theory. Of course, he was laughed off the stage. Nobody was going to accept that. But then Gould and Eldridge came up with punctuated equilibria, which makes it sound so sophisticated. But it was the idea that over millions of years, creatures, whatever they were, plant, animal, stayed the same in stasis. But then there was a sudden burst of evolution in an upward direction that lasted only two, three, four generations. Um, and that caused the evolutionary change, but then there were millions of years of stasis again. So it was flat, punctuated by a rapid burst of a few generations of evolution, and then back to stasis again. So that was punctuated equilibria, flat for millions of years, then punctuated, and then flat again. And so this was simply to actually line up with the evidence that there are no transitional forms in the fossil record, but to try to be consistent with the idea of evolution over millions and billions of years of time. And so if you really think about it, Darwin was, was a microevolutionist, uh, said that evolution was too slow to see. Gould and Eldridge said it's too fast to see. But the only conclusion that a rational person would have to have is you just can't see it. Thank you, Dr. Grady. This one is saying from Chandra Kumar, 
uh, to say hello, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. I love the Q&A show on Revelation TV. Cyrus cross-examination interview with Dr. Grady and Derek is supernatural. Fantastic, gritty and raw and just delivers spoken sinner's prayers, salvation, to use that you what you have written. Dr. Grady, do you believe that will there be no sh um, shedding of blood in planet heaven because we were just glorified body, our taste bud uh, becomes vegetarian? I have no idea what you mean by planet heaven because as far as I know, that's no such thing as a biblical terminology there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have one high priest, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain once, and we will not have a need for shed blood after this, um, but we will be in heaven with him. That's the assurance we have that once we die, we're instantaneously with the Lord. Um, so there's no need for additional uh, blood to be shed. Uh, I know that in the original creation, as we find in Genesis chapter 1, uh, that uh, all creatures, Genesis 1, 29 and 30, were created as vegetarians. But then again, after the flood in Genesis 9, 3, God modified the rules and said, now you shall eat meat. Um, personally, being a missionary that has traveled on five continents, um, I believe that uh, the um, wedding supper of the lamb must be shahasco, which is what they serve in Brazil, uh, which is uh, the best meal I've ever had in my life. <laughs> right. Sure, you, it includes meat. <laughs> uh, Diane written in to say, uh, to asking about marriage. Is marriage man made or instituted by God as my pastor is of the understanding that long term relationships are honored by God and marriage is only a piece of paper? So love and appreciate all at Revelation TV. Mm, interesting. What do you think? Oh, God ordained marriage it, right in the garden. I mean, if you'll take a look at the end of Genesis chapter 2, God performed the first marriage sacrifice, uh, ceremony uh, right in the text. And this is when he made Adam as a perfect male. Then he later made Eve a perfect human female. But Adam had to accept the gift that God had prepared. And we read about that acceptance if you go to verse 23, 24 of chapter 2. And, and God performs the first marriage uh, ceremony. Um, and so he shows us right in the garden. What is his plan? One man, one woman united for a lifetime. It is not simply cohabitation. This one's from Stephen. There's a lot of people from South Wales tonight. So South Wales are certainly watching us tonight, Grady. Evening to Good. you both. Regarding the gospel, what happens to people who have been, who have not heard the gospel? For example, people in the jungle, areas of South America. Well, first of all, we've had this kind of question before, so it's yeah. just a, a variant. But actually, Paul, in his writings, tells us that those who have never heard the gospel, when they die, God will judge them based upon what they knew, because we can see God's laws in nature. Uh, murder has always been considered uh, wrong in every culture uh, of the world. And so any person can see this, even though they may never have read the Bible, whether they have heard the gospel being preached. Um, and we know that God is a loving God, but he's a just God, and that he will judge righteously. But he will judge them based upon what they knew, even if they have never heard the gospel. And the Apostle Paul writes about that. Uh, we've got about three minutes to go, Grady. This one's from Gina from London. Hi, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. An archaeologist in Egypt sometime last year said Joseph's house has been found in Egypt. If this is true, if it is, it will give the skeptics something to think about. That's those who don't believe the Israelites were even in Egypt. Well, but we have a lot of evidence today that, in fact, the Jews were there. Um, there are other inscriptions. And uh, I'm not familiar with that particular report of Joseph's house, but we do know that he was number two in Israel under the Pharaoh that he served. And therefore, he would have had a, a very nice, um, well, perhaps today we'd call it mansion or palace, um, but certainly he had a very nice place to stay. And it's not to say that he may not have had it found by archaeologists after all. We think we have found the place of David's palace as well in in the 
areas of the city of David in Jerusalem. Uh, but whether we have or have not is not the issue. The issue is that he is in the Bible, and he is certainly uh, mentioned with sufficient history to know that he existed. Okay, this quick one here in about just over a minute and a half. What impact does redshift have on creationism? I'm sorry, would you repeat that? What does? Redshift. Oh, redshift. Yes. Oh, and I thought you said web. No, redshift. Well, first of all, redshift is the idea that the farther away we look, uh, that objects are flying away from us, causing the, the light to shift towards the red end of the spectrum. I will say very quickly, because I know we're out of time, go to my website, go to the articles page, find my article on redshift. You're going to find out you can get redshift without expansion, that redshift has now known to be quantized, it is not a smooth curve, and it proves that creation is true because it could not be in concentric circles without an intelligence. Thank you so much, Dr. Grady. Can you give us 30 seconds of message of inspiration for our viewers this evening? Well, I think the information, what I was just talking about, we have and have free articles, free videos, et cetera, free books. They are not free books, but we have books that show that science, good science, lines up exactly with what the Bible says. Therefore, you really can trust the Bible, as well as the historical and archaeological evidence. Everywhere we look, we see proof that the Bible is the Word of God and the only true God is revealed to us through its words and its text. And so I would challenge all of us to be Christians, Bible-believing, believing in biblical inerrancy, and that we accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our salvation, that he is our Lord and Savior, and you can trust in him. Amen. Thank you so much. And we trust in you as well, Dr. Grady. As always, thank you so much for your wonderful knowledge and sharing that on Revelation TV. And God bless you till next time. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thank you so much to all our viewers for tuning in to tonight's Q&A show. We'll be back next week as well. But don't forget, no matter what you're going for in your life, I pray the Lord Heavenly Father is draw closer to you. Whatever situation you have, open up your heart, open up your arms and say, Jesus Christ, come in. Give me that peace. I'm in darkness and I want to see your light. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray that for you tonight. Take care. God bless you. Bye -bye.